Council. We'll call to order the uh, Regional Council meeting for Thursday, May the 26th. And roll call. All members are present except Councillor Groves on other municipal business. Uh, Councillor Miles just walked in. <laughs> Councillor uh, Parrish is on other municipal business. And Councillor Toby's absent. Kova. Oh, and Councillor Kova. Uh, are there any declarations of conflict of interest? Seeing none then, approval of the minutes of May 12, 2016, Regional Council meeting. Uh, moved by Councillor Paleshi, seconded by Councillor Mahoney. Any omissions or changes? No? All in favour? Carried. Uh, approval of the agenda. Uh, Mayor Crombie, seconded by Councillor Fonseca, Councillor Sato. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to add an item onto the agenda for Councillor Parrish. Um, I think it would go under human services. It's with regard to housing and the recent announcements of the um, school board to close schools. Okay. Uh, we'll do that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, so approval of the agenda then, moved by Councillor Inna, second by Councillor Sato. All in favour? Opposed, if any? Carried. Um, uh, before we begin the formal agenda, uh, I would like to take a few moments to address some items of interest. Uh, you are likely aware that this week is Paramedic Awareness Week, and we are honoured to have some of our par Peel paramedics with us today. Um, I wanted to take a, a moment to thank our paramedic staff for the educational CPR AED display outside of the council chambers, and would also like to recognise the unparalleled commitment and dedication our paramedics show every day of the year. We thank you for all that you do. In addition, I would like to provide an update on the installation of the automated external defibrillators, AEDs, in our regional facilities. Installation of the equipment has already begun at 10 PL, and installation at 7120 here in Ontario will begin next month, and public works and other regional facilities will follow. Our goal is to have placement and installation of AEDs completed by this November. I would like to thank our regional staff who have made arrangements for the implementation of these life-saving units. I would also like to take a moment to inform Council of an upcoming emergency management exercise. The Greater Toronto Airport Authority, GTAA, is holding a full-scale functional exercise on Saturday, May the 28th, 2016. It will provide a very realistic and challenging opportunity for all operational groups at the GTAA and emergency response partners agencies to practice and validate plans, procedures and protocol in response to an aircraft crash on GTAA property. The exercise will include the mock-up of an actual crash scene complete with approximately 260 simulated passengers with injuries. The Region Appeal is not hosting the exercise, but will actively participate and utilize regional resources to support the GTAA exercise response. Peel Regional Paramedics and Peel Regional Police will have a significant involvement at the mock crash scene. The Region Appeal will also activate the Region's Emergency Operations Centre to augment the GTAA exercise play and the Region's Emergency Operations Centre will coordinate exercise activities that extend beyond the GTAA, such as communications, public works, human services, public health, regional emergency management, and the executive leadership team. The realism created at the scene may evoke a lot of public interest and curiosity. So we are making Council aware of the emergency exercise so there is clear understanding that this is a training exercise and not an actual aircraft crash. During the simulated exercise, members of Council may receive exercise notifications from the region. These will be easily recognized by the subject line on emails which will state exercise, exercise in order to clearly delineate the exercise information. In the unlikely evident, or sorry, in the unlikely event of an actual incident occurring at the same time as the training exercise, there will be information transmitted to members of council 
which is prefaced with the statement, no duff. If you receive correspondence from senior regional staff or my office that is prefaced with a no duff introductory statement, then you will know the message is real and the emergency exercise has been abandoned due to a real event. The GTAA will be providing messages, messaging to the general public to notify them about the exercise and thereby limit public concerns. The region's customer contact centre will also have scripting available to provide the public if calls are being received at the region. If any member of council requires additional information, I suggest you direct your questions to the regional clerk. Thank you. That brings us to uh, our first delegation. Um, and I would ask uh, if um, the three members who are here from St. John would come forward, Diane Rende, uh, Chairman Graham Walsh, and our past chairman, Mark Dexter. Well, yeah, if you could take a seat there, I hope there's three. Uh, that's great. Um, today we are recognizing St. John Ambulance's Peel Dufferin branch for over 50 years of dedicated service within Peel Region. Joined with us today from Peel Dufferin branch are the Executive Director Diane Rende, Chairman Graham Walsh, and past Chairman Mark Dexter. There are few organizations that are instantly recognizable as St. John Ambulance. Locally, over the course of their 50 years, the St. John Ambulance Organization has had a tremendous impact within our community. Through a variety of first aid courses and training options, education and outreach programs, they have ensured Peel residents are well informed in the event of an emergency. While the dedication of the individuals that belong to this organization is certainly acknowledged, what is less known is that the organization is largely volunteer driven. On a more personal note, I've had the distinct privilege of serving as a member of the board for a number of years and have seen firsthand the great work done by the staff <clears throat> and volunteers of this organization. The dedication and commitment shown by the members of this branch is unparalleled. We would like to thank you for supporting our community and ensuring the health and wellness of Peel residents are held at the highest regard. On behalf of the members of Peel Regional Council, please accept our sincere congratulations on over 50 years of dedicated service within Peel Region. Thank you. And if you just stay in place for a moment, Mayor Thompson. Thank you very much, and I gotta say thank you for your last 50 years of service that you've uh, given to the communities, uh, both Mississauga, Brampton, and Caledon, um, especially the events that we put you put we put on, uh, the tour of Terracotta. You guys are amazing to support that uh, that event, along with many other cross uh, country events that we have taken place. You've always been there to support our community on anything that's been done, but also working with the youth on uh, first aid training is really really key. And uh, just hope you keep up the good work that you're doing because it does have a big impact in our community. So congratulations for 50 years. Thank you. Councillor Sato. Thank you. I would like to echo those <clears throat> comments. And Graham, do you do everything? <laughs> he's, he's, our, he's, uh, he's in the food bank. He's with Toronto right. Scottish and, and a bit of a lawyer on the side, right? Um, and St. John Ambulance, it's, it's just wonderful to see the, the dedication you give. Um, you know, over the years, we have uh, we could not do without St. John Ambulance at our city events. And um, e every, every event we hold, you're there. But I want to particularly thank you, and, and I know Councillor Fonseca and I were very pleased that when we held the big CPR training, actually twice, at uh, Celebration Square with our wonderful paramedics, um, you were right there alongside helping. To, uh, to train over 500 residents in uh, hands-on CPR. So, you know, you, you go beyond just being at those events and uh, we, we really appreciate it. Yeah. I do have a plaque to present to you on behalf of Regional Council and I'd like all of the, the councillors to get in this photo if we can do it. I know it's like herding cats, but, <laughs> but we could... Uh, 
do our best. Moving right along here, our next uh, delegate is Alex Dum Dumel, uh, Senior Manager, Echo Business Programs, Toronto and Region Conservation Authority. Welcome, Alex. And this is with respect to uh, Partners in Project Green Program. And Mr. Chair, uh, distinguished committee members, uh, thank you for having me this morning. As mentioned, my name is Alex Dumel. I'm a senior manager at Toronto Region Conservation. And I'm delighted to be here this morning to share with you um, the results of Partners of Project Green's activities in 2015. Good morning to everyone. Uh, well, essentially, the development of Partners of Project Green at Eco Business, uh, Pearson Eco Business Zone, is really the culmination of over a decade of partnerships between the Greater Toronto Airports Authority, Toronto Region Conservation, the Region of Peel, and the City of Toronto. It's a partnership that was born um, out of a common understanding and drive to essentially restore and protect and enhance the natural resources across the region. With the support of the region, the City of, of of Mississauga, the city of, of Brampton, the town of Caledon, and the city of Toronto. Partners in Project Green today is now aiming to build and activate the largest eco-business community in the world. Now, recognizing that the Pearson Eco Business Zone and most of the employment areas where we operate are largely built out, Partners of Project Green is working actively to help achieve, to help the, the region of Peel achieve its climate change objectives and green the greater region's economy by helping the business community essentially transform the way it operates and take on a, a leadership stance in, in the areas of climate change. Of course, we couldn't have done it without important champions and strong leadership. And I'd like to take a few moments to acknowledge the people that have been working directly and also at arm's length with the region to help us along our journey. People like Andrew Farr, uh, Mayor Crombie, uh, Brenda Osborne, Councillor Fonseca, Dale Pine, Councillor Willens, Karen Hogan, Jeff Baines, Councillor Bowman, Lorian Farrell, Larry Miller, of course, Lincoln Khan, Munif Ahmad, Norman Lee, 
Susan Emery, and much more. Your guidance, your advice, and your support has been instrumental in our success. Now, as is the nature of things, um, our terms of reference come cycle every two years, and we will be sad to see a few of you uh, stepping down from leadership roles in our community. I know you'll still be involved, but we'll also be very happy and we're very excited to welcome new people uh, like uh, Councillor Mahoney and others that are joining us and uh, the cause to, to help us continue growing the support in the community and making a difference with the over, over the 650 businesses that we work with uh, on, on average every year. Now meeting the challenge. With uh, COP21 uh, summit in Paris, uh, announcements uh, for carbon taxes, uh, cap and trade announcements, uh, economical juggernauts coming to the table to tackle climate change, we can say that 2015 may very well be a year to, remem to be remembered for uh, the global efforts uh, to confront climate change. For businesses, the, climate, the, the challenge is really immense and immediate. It means for them to find new ways to drastically reduce their carbon emissions. Supported by the region of Peel, uh, we've taken a strong leadership stance in this area, and our 2015 results really speak to a, sim to a simple truth. We are much stronger when, and much more efficient when we work together. So here are some of the results. Our energy performance uh, programs have certainly not disappointed and uh, helped to directly and indirectly influence the community to reduce 38,000 tons of equivalent uh, carbon dioxide emissions on an annual basis last year through programs such as our Energy Leaders uh, program that leverages peer-to-peer -peer learning. Um, participants were able to reduce their energy bill by $4.5 million annually. Um, and, and take on 85 projects. Uh, we're the first, uh, we were uniquely positioned to work with local utilities such as Enbridge, Enersource, and the region of Peel Water to come together and collaborate, uh, not only to identify energy and conservation, uh, energy and water conservation opportunities and help implement those projects, but to actually find synergies between the utilities programs and reduce um, the duplication of efforts. We recognized that there was an important need in the electric vehicle infrastructure space. There were not a lot of charging stations in the region, and let alone across the province. And because we were so actively engaged with the community, we were able to leverage this community to have 80 new charging stations installed. These are publicly available charging stations, and we're continually, continuously working with the region and the city of Brampton to have a couple more installed so we can hit our 100, our 100 charging station milestone. Uh, it's not a small feat when we consider that across the province, when we started this project a year and a half ago, there were only 400 publicly available charging stations. When we think about climate change, our first instinct is to think about energy. But water is something not to be neglected. Of course, we know how much our municipalities need to spend in energy, uh, the energy that they consume to pump the water and treat the water. And so water is a natural, is a natural area of focus. Uh, I'm happy to report that through our programs, uh, helping boost in, um, enrollment in municipal municipal uh, water audits and helping implement uh, industrial water reuse processes and stormwater uh, management projects, we were able to, to reduce uh, 200 million, over 200 million liters of water uh, that was offset in the region. In terms of waste management, our materials exchange program uh, was very active this year again, with 26 um, exchanges and over 4,000 tons of materials diverted from landfill. Amazing stories that range from uh, industrial motors being recycled at the airport, um, syrup Coca-Cola syrup barrels being converted to, uh, to uh, stormwater barrels or planters, um, plastic wrap and, and, uh, and resin and Velcro offcuts uh, here in Brampton that were converted to plastic lumber and uh, to be used in a whole other industry. 
We're very excited about one particular program in terms of waste management. And we, in 2015, we were able to create the region's first tree and wood recovery center. It's, um, it's right in uh, Councillor Tovey's ward at the center of Mary Curtis Park. This is the first center of its kind to be able to collect tree waste, whether it's ash trees or others, and convert it so that that lumber is reinjected into the local economy. Most of the lumber is actually going to lumber markets, it's going to artisans, it's going to tree, uh, to furniture manufacturers, it's going to, to woodworking programs in a number of schools. And it's a really big success. And I'm really proud to say that the city of Brampton has accepted to divert all of its tree waste through this center. Out of the 650 businesses that come out to our events, that participate in our programs, 100 of them last year decided to, pl to play a more active role and formalized their membership in Partners of Project Green, which is an increase of 30% from the year before. A number of them participated in our People Power Challenge, which is a program geared to boost employee engagement. And through this program, close to 10,000 pledges were made, uh, over 1,000 ideas were generated for employers, which converted into 252 pro projects implemented. Our events were quite successful as well, and you'll be happy to learn that close uh, to over 1,400 participants came out to our hands-on workshops. A number of our, of our um, uh, networking events, our behind-the-scenes tours, uh, even 800 trees were planted uh, near Highway 4, 410 and 407 in Mississauga with the help of uh, Credit Valley Conservation, and it was a huge success for our events uh, all in all last year. Now, this is not an area of, typically an area of focus for us, but we recognize that there's a lot to be done in terms of transportation. A lot of emissions are generated by the trucks that are on our roads and the, and the, and the, and the vehicles that are on our roads, moving products that are vital to our economy. That's why last year we entered into a partnership with uh, Natural Resources Canada to build uptake in the Smartway Transport Partnership. It's a program that was designed uh, in the U.S. and there's a large, a large uptake in the U.S to help organizations benchmark the, the efficiency of their fleets and reduce the emissions that are related to their operations. Now there's always something exciting happening at Partners in Project Green and here are a few examples of some of the things that we're looking forward to and I hope that you look forward to them as well. We're currently in talks with the help of some of the members of this committee uh, with different levels of government, provincial and federal, to fund a new center for innovation adoption. The purpose will be essentially to help businesses overcome the barriers that are associated with Canadian corporate conservatism. It's often difficult for them to adopt existing, powerful existing um, innovation, uh, innovative clean technologies. And we're hoping to really show, showcase the leadership of the region in terms of innovation through this program. We're hoping to help boost the clean tech sector and at the same time strengthen uh, pretty much the competitiveness of our local industries. We're also happy and looking forward to potentially participating um, in an ICNI organ, uh, organics waste diversion project with the region. Hopefully we will be able to help identify new ways how the, uh, on how the business community can help create value for future potential uh, anaerobic digestion facilities in the region. We're also being, being, uh, we've also been uh, filtering a lot of questions in terms of stormwater management, particularly in Mississauga. Um, and uh, we're confident that through our talks with the city of Mississauga and the region of Peel and the, and the Peel District School Board, we're going to be able to, to find new ways to leverage some of the projects that we have going outside the region and to get more of the businesses to really take a leadership stance and divert some of this stormwater and reduce uh, their impact on municipal infrastructure. This marks an end of my presentation. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for having me this morning and particularly for your ongoing support. Really, the world is watching and um, the leadership of the region, uh, thanks to, you know, through uh, Mr. Schwark and, and all of the, the, the commissioners, um, has really put us in a unique position to mobilize the business community and make a meaningful economical, social, environmental impact across the region. And I really thank you, all of you, for, for your ongoing support. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Fonseca. 
Thank you, three, Mr. Chair. Thank you for being here this morning, Alex, and uh, wonderful presentation. I just wanted to say thank you uh, to you and having the opportunity over, I guess I've been involved with Partners in Project Green through TRCA um, for, I think this is my fifth year now. And um, I think what you said in terms of um, everyone is watching. Uh, this zone, this not only the the zone around the airport and the business park there, uh, but also throughout and how how the projects um, and how the businesses and government and other leaders within the community and the conservation authorities have come together here. Um, uh, it's just made such a difference in terms of how programs um, matching the environment, what can be done from a sustainability standpoint and the economy uh, can work. Uh, they, can, they can work on a large scale, but they can also work for medium-sized businesses, small businesses, and also um, potentially new business opportunities for uh, in and around the GTA, and I think that's extremely important. And we often talk about the fact that, you know, there's government, different levels of government here, 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 here. How is that, how is that policy or whatever is happening at that level? How is that going to be implemented within communities on the ground level and how is it going to work with businesses? And I know that being on, I'm on the Water Stewardship Committee and it's, uh, the environment is such that we challenge each other, including the businesses and they feel like they, um, they can challenge all of us to work together to make sure that it is able to work. And I think that makes a big difference. We need, we know that we need businesses to be involved and uh, not only at the table, but on the ground making things happen. And um, I just, I think it's, uh, it's been a great learning experience for me, but at the same time, it's not just about ideas, it's about turning those ideas into action and benefit for all involved. And I think what's also really important is when we talk about resilience and adaptation um, on these committees and through Partners in Project Green, I think the businesses of, uh, and it's part of their culture that they always have to be thinking forward, they always have to be moving forward in terms of what's happening next to make sure that they are, they're thriving. And I think it, when you show some of the projects that uh, Partners in Project Green are looking forward to in the future, it shows that uh, this is a really good model to ensure that we're all working together on it. So just want to thank you. I'm looking forward to continuing to be involved uh, with, um, with Partners in Project Green and um, very excited that some others around the table are here are as well. And uh, also thank Peel Region for continuing to be involved. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Mayor Crombie. Thank you, Alex. So nice to see you again. You really do represent the voice of sustainability in, in Peel for us. Just wanted to ask, what are your membership numbers up to now? Thank you for your question. Well, um, as you know, every year the number, the number of members goes down to zero. It's an annual commitment that we believe sort of helps organizations sort of cement the, their level of engagement. So last year was 100. Now we're, we're closing in May and we're already up to close to 90 members that have Fantastic. signed up on, on board and hopefully are, are on our way to meet our, our target of 140 this year. I hope all regional councillors here have an awareness of the work you do, and if not, please do, because it's a fantastic organization. And you don't work just in the Pearson Airport corridor, it's really throughout uh, the GTA, and you've done some incredible things. Uh, we were taking a very close look at, during the Paris uh, climate change talks, we were looking at COP21 and the mayor, that mayor's compact of, uh, on climate on sustainability, rather, uh, and the... Uh, membership requirements are quite onerous so we're looking to you to help us achieve some of those so uh, we looked at it we thought gee you know why aren't we invited to participate and it's quite onerous if you want to be a member of COP21 mm -hmm. with respect to the targets that have to be set for your entire region the financial commitment the plan you have to make so our of course uh, we're looking at it at the city you know over the next few years um, on creating that plan but it's a long-term project for sure uh, and and how will how will project and Partners Green change and evolve as we move into a cap and trade economy here in Ontario? Well, um, there's on a number of fronts, actually, you know, we have to really start asking ourselves the tough questions and where should we prioritize. 
A distinction of Partners of Project Green has always been the fact that we've been able to implement a lot of the initiatives that need to happen. The projects, you know, at some point we lay out the plans, we do a lot of things, but people need the tools to actually get those projects into the ground, and I think we'll continue playing that role. Uh, one of the initiatives that I mentioned and um, helping to boost um, adoption of innovation will be an important role, I believe, for Partners of Project Green in the future because, you know, so much depends on, on our businesses and our institutions adopting some of the existing uh, innovative clean technologies that already exist out there. First, there's a number of reasons, I won't outline them today, but they're, that, that this is not happening. You know, businesses are too busy managing their own operations. They have you know, short-term pressures. Um, there's reluctance and, and it's quite frankly, a bit of ignorance in terms of what's available out there. We'd really like to continue playing a, a more active role in connecting them with the local innovators here that are actually producing things that sometimes are very successful abroad and for some reason their technologies are not being adopted here. Um, we can all benefit um, from an in increased adoption from that standpoint. Our economy becomes better, those clean tech companies prosper, they're making their teeth locally but at the same and, and preparing themselves for larger exports and at the same time our businesses are becoming stronger. Another role that we'd like to play and that we're going to be uh, really looking actively is to help businesses transform who they are. I, I talked about transforming their operations, that really means this, we, we produce a widget today and let's find a way to produce that widget in a way that's more sustainable tomorrow. Transforming who you are is questioning really what business that you're in, um, how you're actually delivering those services and can you rethink things. Are you selling toasters or are you really, what you're really selling is the experience of eating fresh bread uh, or toasted bread and so is there an opportunity for you to send out those toasters into the marketplace but really have a vested interest in taking them back and, and transforming them and, tr and creating more value out of those products so they don't end up in the landfill. So you're creating new opportunities and helping new entrepreneurs emerge. Thank you, Alex. I just encourage all the regional councillors to get to know you a little better and participate in some of your events or your workshops. They're, they're always really worthwhile. And uh, you never repeat that. Remember we had that debate of the Tobies? Yes. That, that was a, a, the, 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 the modeled after the debaters. That was really a lot of fun. So I encourage everyone to, to get involved and get to know partners in Project Green a little more. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Toby. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and, and thanks a lot for all the work you do, Alex. It's, it's absolutely outstanding. I just uh, really like to <clears throat> give a shout out to uh, to your CEO, Brian Denny, because I know he was one of the driving forces to actually get this uh, get this implemented in the first place. Uh, and uh, I've always said that the uh, conservation authorities, when we're dealing with uh, climate adaptation, are really they're they're the knowledge leaders. You, I mean, you are the knowledge leaders in all of Canada. So I guess my question would be, how can we help you? Because uh, at the city of Mississauga, we've, of course, moved down in my ward, we have, uh, you know, the um, first and third street where we've done uh, bioswales. It was the first project of its kind in Ontario. But we very just recently had uh, low impact development uh, projects also t uh, considered uh, infrastructure, officially considered infrastructure. So now we're setting up, uh, you know, an inspection regi regime for them so that when somebody, say, does an infill, for example, and they cut through the middle of a bioswale, they won't be able to cover it up now until our inspectors come in. They'll have to pay deposits on it to make, you know, security deposits, just like you do with any other infrastructure. So I was just kind of wondering, because we, you're absolutely right, we do have so many techniques that we already know work, the conservation mm -hmm. authority no work. So I, I guess my question is, how, how legislatively would we be able to help? Mm. Well, I mean, in terms of legislation, I mean, there's a there's a number of ways. Uh, two years ago, uh, we had the we had the privilege of of working with the region and the town of Caledon to develop, you know, new guidelines on how to develop greenfield uh, new eco business zones from a greenfield standpoint. You know, so. You guys are managing, you are essentially managing growth on, on a day-to-day -day basis and, and considering um, bodies of knowledge that have been produced uh, from that standpoint is, mm -hmm. is, an important, is an important way. How can 
when new businesses implement themselves, how can they already put their best, best foot forward so that we're not engaging them on the small stuff, but we can, we can start conversations and actions on things that are even more meaningful. Today, we have, to, we have to get them to even think about the basics, but if they're already part of something where they were sort of forced, into, a little bit forced into a more mold, but a more, more encouraged into a mold, and um, it will help the, their thought process quite a bit. Uh, beyond that, I, you know, I definitely appreciate um, all of you empowering your staff to, um, to work with us. Um, on some of these, on some of the important issues, you know, I'm thinking about the city of Mississauga and the stormwater management uh, surcharge, for example. But a number of things, uh, we welcoming us to the table is is, is really uh, is really valuable for us and sharing the issue so we can keep our our, our eyes open for potential solutions. Um, I mentioned there's a number of powerful initiatives that we want to set and put in place, and uh, some of you have already stepped up and help us. Um, uh, uh, get uh, obtain meetings um, with other levels of government. You know, uh, Mayor Crombie's office has been very generous in helping us um, to secure meetings with uh, Minister Baines, for example. That kind of support is really, really, uh, really useful. Um, and then, and then the next thing is, um, businesses can do what they what they can on, on an individual basis. But at some point, we should start thinking about what kind of legislation can help encourage them to think beyond their walls and collaborate. So district scale projects are really difficult to put together because we're used to doing our own thing. So I'm not suggesting that we should force people to do this, but how can we encourage them to think in those terms? And I know the region's already considering this kind of thing when, when we're thinking about anaerobic digestion facilities. Uh, but there might be other opportunities, so any help there can, is appreciated. Yeah, that's great, thank you, and, and, and thanks for uh, sending Sawmill Sid down to uh, to my ward. We've we've had a great. He's got a great operation down there. If anybody gets a chance to go in behind the small arms building, he's he's always out there cutting wood. We've done I don't know how many uh, school tours we've done through there now. It's just been fantastic. And Saturday we're doing another one. We're doing a Jane's Walk down there, so we'll be showing everybody Sid's great work. And if anybody wants a really cool tabletop, wow, has he ever got some nice pieces of wood? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Pelleschi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Alex, thank you for coming. Uh, over here. Right here. <laughs> this way. <laughs> thank you. No problem. Um, I, I have to say that my counterpart at uh, the city level, Councillor Willens, is a, is a member of Partners in Project Green, and he's always coming back to the city and, and talking about the great initiatives that uh, that you guys are doing, and he's, he's very... Uh, um, it, it, it brings a glow to his face when he's talking about all of these things. He he really uh, enjoys that, and um, um, and I also have to say that uh, you, you mentioned the AD system and and uh, the fact that you know this council set a 75 percent diversion target for uh, for the next 20 years, and and we're definitely going to have to sit with uh, um, organizations like you to uh, to come to, together and and talk about how we're going to reach those goals. Um, over the next 20 years, or uh, if we can get there anytime sooner. So uh, I look very much forward to, uh, to talking to you and talking to the partners in the, in the very near future. Thank you very much. We look forward to it as well. Thank you. Councillor Mahoney. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Alex, for uh, coming. And just uh, further to Councillor Pelushi's uh, comments. Um, I am getting involved in Partners in Project Green, and I didn't uh, really know of all the good projects that you're doing. Um, but on the um, uh, diversion, one of the things that we've talked to in kind of broad strokes is, uh, is some of the multi-res and ICI um, waste that uh, currently isn't being diverted properly. So I think Alex and I, like I say, have discussed that and seeing how we can work with them in collaboration with the region uh, to see if we can't tackle some of those to, uh, to achieve our lofty targets of the 75 percent so um, so I look forward to working with you Alex I appreciate all the work you do Alex sits on uh, the environment committee at the city of Mississauga too so again want to thank you for coming and uh, look forward to um, moving some of these projects along thank, thank you. you yeah thanks very much Alex and I you know I, I always feel that we're so blessed to have three leading conservation authorities within our jurisdiction here in in Peel and uh, you know, I, I was privileged to sit at one term on the TRCA, and I can—I certainly witnessed firsthand the great work that the TRCA has done and is continues to do. And certainly, the snapshot that you've shown us today, with respect to the Partners in Green project, um, is an excellent example of, of the good work that you do do. And uh, we just ask that you continue it. And uh, on behalf of Council, bring our best regards to Brian Denny and all the staff at TRCA. 
Thank you for being here. Thank you for your time. Um, a motion of receipt moved by Councillor Fonseca, seconded by Mayor Crombie. All in favor? Opposed, if any, carried. Thank you. That moves us to uh, items related to health. If uh, Councillor Moore, if you'd be kind enough to chair this section, please. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members of committee, there are two reports and both have presentations. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Davila to make some introductions. Uh, both, and we'll bring the reports forward during the time of the presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair. And if I can just make one correction, there's in fact one report, but two presentations. Sorry. That's okay. The uh, first uh, presentation that we have for you today is in association with the report before you on vector-borne disease in Peel. And if I may, I will introduce my two colleagues. Paul Can Callanan is the Director of Environmental Health at Peel Public Health. And Dr. Lawrence Lowe is one of our relatively new Associate Medical Officers of Health. He joined us at Peel Public Health earlier this year, in fact, in January. So we'll call them up to the front uh, to give you a bit of a presentation that goes with our vector-borne disease report. And excuse me if I can, immediately following this presentation, we'll have a brief presentation on measles. Uh, courtesy of our Communicable Diseases Director, Isabel Mock, and another Associate Medical Officer of Health colleague of mine, Dr. Kate Bingham, who you would have met at the last Council meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Davila, and thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair and members of Council, uh, we very much appreciate the opportunity to provide this presentation for information uh, to share additional context on the Vector-Borne Disease Program Report that is before you. Uh, our presentation is divided into two parts. In my role as Associate Medical Officer of Health, I will speak uh, a bit about the diseases uh, that these programs are concerned with. Um, and Mr. Callanan will discuss the data and numbers as well as the current activities undertaken by Peel Public Health to monitor and control these diseases in our community. So vector-borne diseases in scientific textbooks will tell you that they are transmitted by arthropods, but a simple way to think about it is uh, Vector-borne diseases of human health interests are typically transmitted by mosquitoes and ticks. Uh, these are uh, um, both. Uh, these uh, concern both diseases that are of local interest here in Ontario, as well as diseases that can be acquired abroad. Um, and specific diseases of interest in Ontario, which I will touch upon, include West Nile virus and Lyme disease, which we both note local transmission of here in Peel, as well as Eastern equine encephalitis, which has been found in Ontario. Uh, amongst horses, but we have not had any human cases to date. Um, other vector-borne diseases of concern that we do not have any uh, transmission of here in Ontario are malaria, dengue hemorrhagic fever, and yellow fever, which are typically acquired by travel, um, as well as a number of emerging diseases which we have presented to Council on, both around chikungunya as well as most recently the Zika virus. Uh, it's important to note that while vector-borne diseases in Peel are typically low in terms of absolute numbers and overall risk, uh, there is considerable public concern and public health interest in monitoring and controlling, continuing to uh, uh, drive our efforts in controlling these diseases. So West Nile virus is a disease that uh, has been of interest in Ontario and is reportable. Uh, it is transmitted by mosquitoes. and. Uh, Typically, most people with symptoms, uh, and most people who are infected with the West Nile virus do not actually develop symptoms. Uh, for those who do develop some symptoms, it is a general uh, fever, vomiting, diarrhea uh, kind of picture that tends to recover. Uh, th these individuals tend to recover on their own and completely, uh, and may occasionally have fatigue and weakness that lasts uh, onwards for a few weeks to months afterwards. Um, in very rare situations, there are individuals who have severe symptoms. Um, in all cases, however, the best prevention for West Nile virus is uh, to actually prevent mosquito bites. Um, and for, that, for those purposes, we usually recommend individuals use repellent and wear appropriate clothing. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Mr. Callanan will speak uh, to peel specific numbers in the second part of this presentation. Lyme disease is a disease that has gained considerable public interest in recent times. Uh, it uh, is typically transmitted by the bite of an infected black-legged tick. 
Uh, it's important to note that the black legged tick does not have an established population in Peel region, though the geographic range of this tick has been expanding in Ontario, most typically in eastern and uh, eastern and northwestern parts of the province. Um, they are, there are uh, typical symptoms of fever, headache, fatigue, characteristic bullseye, rash, but for the most part, Lyme disease is, uh, is, um, is, it can be difficult to diagnose and is fairly rare. Uh, it's also important to note that prevention is the name of the game when it comes to Lyme disease as well. There is no human Lyme disease vaccine and there is currently no approved way to control ticks, but Mr. Callanan will speak a bit more about public health's efforts to actually monitor the, uh, the, the uh, detection and spread of black-legged ticks in Ontario and in Peel region. And finally, I just wanted to provide some updates on emerging vector-borne diseases that we have brought before Council before. Uh, in 2014, uh, there was a noted increase in uh, chikungunya, and most recently there's, uh, there has been the Zika virus, uh, which we have also presented to Council on. Uh, specific to chikungunya, uh, there was a surge in travel-related cases in 2014. Um, and it's important to note that since that time, uh, cases have continued to decline and uh, again, uh, it continues to circulate in the Caribbean and uh, Latin America as well as in some of the Pacific uh, Ocean Islands. Um, but for the most part, the, the, the best uh, means to prevent chikungunya is either to avoid travel to those areas or for those who do travel to uh, employ appropriate repellents and, uh, and clothing as well. And last but not least, speaking to the Zika virus, um, and uh, as of uh, April 25th, 2016, which is when the, this presentation was uh, put together, uh, there were uh, 46 countries affected by the current outbreak and 55 travel-related cases in Canada. Um, that number has, uh, has increased, I believe, to uh, the mid-80s. Um, and there has been one case uh, in Ontario uh, acquired through sexual transmission. Zika virus is very similar to uh, the uh, concerns around rubella, German measles in the 80s, where we're less concerned with the actual disease itself, but more on the possible complications associated with Zika virus. And uh, there is a growing scientific consensus that Zika virus is associated with both microcephaly, uh, which is essentially a small uh, a, a birth defect in babies of infected mothers, and Guillain-Barre syndrome. Uh, ongoing research is uh, attempting to determine what the potential risk is associated with people, who, uh, associated with developing these outcomes around Zika virus. But in the absence of, uh, of uh, clear and defining research, uh, the World Health Organization continues to declare a public health emergency of international concern. Um, to that end, what we, uh, what we have been doing uh, around Zika virus has been uh, to monitor specific guidelines and research uh, to assist with our surveillance and situational awareness of the Zika virus. Uh, liaising with our provincial and federal partners and providing education for both the public uh, here in Peel as well as to our hospital and healthcare partners in the region. Uh, we have sent three professional updates uh, to healthcare providers as well as conducted rounds at a number of local uh, hospitals here and we will continue to monitor the situation as it develops. So given these as the vector-borne diseases of interest, I would like to pass it over to Mr. Callanan now to discuss what Peel Public Health is doing to address these. Thanks. Thanks, if Lawrence. I, if I can interrupt you for just a moment, Paul. Mm -hmm. um, there are three speakers on the board. Would you like to wait until the... Okay. Go ahead. Thanks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Thanks, Lawrence. Um, since the uh, West Nile virus program, um, or West Nile virus became established in Peel Region in 2002, we've had an annual vector-borne disease program. And uh, that consists, as this slide indicates, of uh, three components. Surveillance, which is the monitoring of mosquitoes and ticks, as well as human cases. Reduction of mosquitoes in targeted areas. And public education. And I'll briefly describe each of those components. So with respect to surveillance, uh, we do larval and adult stage mosquito surveillance. In terms of larva, that's the uh, earlier stage of mosquito development, which occurs in water. Um, so we have uh, students and staff who sample standing water and uh, do mosquito identification in-house. If a uh, 
site uh, with a vector mosquito, that is a mosquito of uh, interest in the transmission of uh, West Nile virus is identified, then we refer that site to an external contractor that we, uh, that we engage each year. There's about 40 species of mosquitoes uh, prevalent in Peel region, only two of which, the Culex species, which uh, are associated with vector-borne uh, disease transmission, West Nile virus in particular, are of interest. With respect to uh, adult surveillance, we have 31 traps, uh, at least one uh, set up in each political ward. Batches are collected on a weekly basis and taken to a lab, a lab for identification of the species of mosquito as well as the number of mosquitoes, and uh, they also do viral testing for West Nile virus. So in terms of the numbers, in 2015, we had two human cases of West Nile virus and 22 positive mosquito pools. In, uh, in 2014, there were also 22 positive mosquito pools, uh, but zero human cases. And between 2001 and 2015, the range has been between zero and 24 human cases of West Nile virus. With respect to Lyme disease, uh, there were two human cases last year, both of which were related to travel. And uh, in the same period between 2001 and 2015, uh, there's been between one and 18 cases of Lyme disease. <coughs> With respect to eastern equine encephalitis, there were zero cases in 2015. As Lawrence mentioned, there, there has never been a human case of uh, um, that type of encephalitis in, in Ontario. Uh, there has, however, been uh, human cases in New York State and uh, positive horses from time to time in Ontario and New York State. So it's something that uh, we, we monitor. The, uh, Oh, let's go back for a second. So with, with respect to uh, other vector-borne diseases of interest, malaria, 36 uh, human cases in 2015, all of which were travel-related. Malaria is not transmitted in Canada, uh, nor is dengue and yellow fever, and there were zero cases amongst Peel residents in, in 2015. So a little more detail on, on Lyme disease. We do passive surveillance and active surveillance for Lyme disease. So ticks uh, that are, uh, that are uh, brought in by members of the public are are, um, identified in-house and if it is uh, a black-legged tick or a deer tick, uh, same, same thing, uh, we transmit that, uh, that sample to the public health lab in Winnipeg for identification of the bacteria that causes Lyme disease. In 2015, there were 36 tick samples that were brought in, 11 of which were black-legged ticks and three had that particular uh, bacteria. Uh, in 2014, there were 11 tick samples, uh, three were black-legged ticks, and none had that particular bacteria. So as uh, Lawrence indicated, there has not been uh, a tick population of that particular tick established in Ontario, but it's something that we're following very carefully. Uh, if um, it appears as if a human case is transmitted locally, we will do more active surveillance, which involves uh, tick dragging. It's basically a um, blanket that's dragged um, behind uh, an operator, uh, and we hope that the tick will jump on the blanket, we'll be able to get a, a sample of the tick and uh, be able to identify the bacteria. We've done that a couple of times in Peel Regis. I know it's not very sophisticated, but <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's the best way you can actually find ticks. Uh, and we haven't been successful so far, which is, which is a good thing in some respects. Um, but if we are able to find the ticks, then we would send the samples in. Um, ticks are distributed by, uh, by songbirds, so it would not be unusual for a uh, tick to jump from the Rouge Valley, for example, where it was identified in 2014 into, uh, into Peel Region. So as I said, it's something that we're following closely. With respect to uh, mosquito reduction, uh, larvicide is applied to approximately 100,000 catch basins in, in uh, Peel Region. Roadside catch basins are the place that you would find these Culex uh, species mosquitoes that are responsible for uh, West Nile virus transmission. So uh, we apply to catch basins in Mississauga and Brampton and, and more urban areas of Caledon. 
Um, eliminating standing water is an effective approach. As I mentioned, the larvae develop in standing water uh, for, that, that, that is there for seven days or more. So if you can eliminate the standing water, that's a very effective control measure. So we do public education in that regard. Um, tires and artificial containers and pool water covers uh, where the pool hasn't been put back into operation are areas that you would find these particular mosquitoes. Uh, we also work with the area municipalities to improve drainage wherever that's possible and uh, investigate complaints about uh, standing water on public and private property. Adulticiding is something that would be continued. We do have it uh, considered if uh, there's an imminent risk. We do have an adulticiding plan. We have not ad uh, adulticided since 2001. Um, adulticiding is the least effective uh, means of mosquito control for obvious reasons. The mosquitoes are, are disseminated far and wide and uh, the, the uh, pesticide needs to come in contact with the mosquito in order to be effective. So uh, it's, it's best if you can deal with it where the mosquitoes breed in the standing water. Finally, uh, the third, uh, third piece is public education. So there's a variety of ways that we share information through the media, through our website, uh, peelbugbite.ca, and uh, we encourage people to sign up at uh, that website to receive email notification of positive mosquito pools in their area so that they will know that they're at risk. As council will know, uh, whenever a positive mosquito pool is identified, we, we let you know uh, each year. And um, finally, as in, as in past years, local health care providers are provided with information via health professionals' updates. So um, Lawrence also alluded to the prevention um, measures. It's, it's important um, with both mosquitoes and ticks to remember that wearing light-colored clothing is more effective than darker clothing. Wear clothing that covers the skin to avoid bites, uh, using repellent for either mosquitoes or ticks or both. Uh, avoiding areas where there's a lot of mosquitoes or ticks and making sure that summer screens are intact so those insects can't get in where we live uh, are the most important control measures and also uh, eliminating standing water on your property if it's possible. So in conclusion, we have a vector-borne disease uh, surveillance and control program in place again this year. It, it has started. We'll keep you up to date as, uh, as the season wears on and, and things develop. Um, and uh, if there are any questions, we'd be happy to uh, respond. Thank you Thank very you. much, gentlemen. We've got uh, three speakers on the board. Councillor Sato. Thank you. Um, you know, I, th I think, thank you for being here. I think we've done an excellent job on educating with West Nile. And um, over the years, with all of the prevention that we have done and the, uh, the response and the education, um, I think most residents in Peel are aware of, um, of how to protect themselves against West Nile, which is a very good thing. And I guess all of the initial media um, <coughs> that uh, caused a lot of alarm, uh, rightly so, um, has helped people to, to look for the information. So I think we're doing an excellent job there. Um, th this year, I, I am really concerned about the Lyme disease issue. And um, uh, I, I, even though the, the Ministry of the Environment, I guess it is, it does the map showing uh, where they are, um, even though they don't include this area, um, my own vet, who is uh, in the Britannia Ninth Line area, lives in Oakville, and she removed one off her small dog, who never goes beyond the backyard, um, and it did test positive for uh, carrying the Lyme disease and that was in Oakville. So a lot of the vets in Mississauga, and I assume in, in the other areas this year, are actually adding the um, tick prevention to the heartworm medication and are very concerned about, uh, about ticks and about Lyme disease because if your pet carries it in, you know, there's a good chance that it's going to get on, uh, on a human as well. And uh, if, you know, when you speak with residents, and I have a few who, um, who have um, I don't want to say have had because they continue to, uh, to be ill from Lyme disease uh, 10, 20 years later. And um, they, uh, when you hear what they have gone through from, uh, from having Lyme disease, you certainly, it's something you don't ever want 
to see. And as you said, the testing for it is very difficult and it's not readily available and most doctors don't don't test people for Lyme disease and the symptoms uh, are so similar to other things that it's uh, it's not usually detected until it's too late. But um, the, the prevention here, again, is, is key. And our animal services staff in, uh, in Mississauga have, um, have revamped the website and they have a special section on ticks and Lyme disease. And they have even, um, uh, I've given them this little chart that I found somewhere that showed where to check your animal for ticks when they come in. And uh, they checked it over with some veterinarians in, in the city and they said, well, there's other areas that this chart didn't show. So our animal services staff have designed their own chart um, showing an animal and all of the areas specifically where residents should be checking every time you have your animal out in, um, in grassy areas. Um, and, and really that's what we need to be promoting is that prevention and the alert, the awareness and, uh, and the severity of the disease if, if you get it. Um, you know, people don't just stay here in their little pocket of, uh, of peel. Mm -hmm. uh, they travel, they travel with their families, they go camping, and the, the risk of, um, of picking up ticks, I'm paranoid about ticks. I mean, with, I'm always checking my dog, checking myself, and you know, I've, I've never touched wood, I've never had to remove one. Um, and, I, and I don't look forward to it. You know, I've read all the stuff about how you do it and all these new methods and stuff. But it, it's interesting that um, uh, one, one of the best preventions, and of course we don't allow it in Mississauga, is um, having chickens in your backyard. <laughs> if you don't want ticks in your backyard, apparently guinea hens um, in particular love ticks. And they love deer ticks more than anything else. It was kind of a... So, you know, if you want to get rid, if you want to keep them out of your property, <laughs> Jim's like, don't touch that one. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, we, we get requests for people to keep chickens all the time. And, um, but I'm, I'm not sure that the backyards are, are always going to be the worst place where people are going to pick them up. But I think it's important that residents know that if they do find them, um, on their pets or on themselves that uh, that the region of Peel that we will check them out yes and I know a lot of people don't know that That's what I didn't know. and um, you know the the Peel bug bite I didn't know that people could sign up on Peel bug bite for the mosquito um, uh, for the pool testing results so I think that's very important as well but again you know the education is the key and uh, it worked with West Nile and I think people are becoming more aware of Lyme disease as well and you know as I said if seeing someone who we, we had a lady who came to Miss Saga Council quite a few years ago now and just hearing what she was still going through and what her family was going through with Lyme disease it's just something you don't ever ever want to see anyone get and uh, and, and even your pets they, they can be treated and they can get over it but I think it's always there so Great, great presentation, and uh, and keep up the good work. And could I suggest perhaps? Um, I, I know I've asked our, our staff in Mississauga to link to the region's website. Um, I, I don't know what uh, what Brampton Animal Services is doing in this regard, but perhaps we could put a link on our website here at the region to the Mississauga Animal Services site that has the information that is yeah. dealing specifically with the pets so that we can uh, cross-reference everything. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Councillor Sato. Councillor Raz. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for your presentation today. Um, uh, I guess I'll ask a more macro question first. Uh, when we're looking forward uh, at uh, the changing climate, obviously, have you done any projections on how <coughs> these types of vector-borne diseases are going to migrate and change over time in Peel Region? We, we have not. Uh, there are others that have uh, with uh, Ministry of Natural Resources and with public health agencies. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is a concern, however, and uh, certainly the geographic distribution of Lyme risk areas in Ontario has expanded. Uh, I mentioned Rouge Valley in 2014. That was a, that was a big uh, expansion into eastern Toronto. 
Um, and if, if you look back a number of years, uh, Lyme disease was in a thin band around the Great Lakes. Now it's pretty prevalent in eastern Ontario. Um, so I, th I think it's only a matter of time before it comes to Peel, something we're monitoring closely. Thank you for that. Uh, when we look at uh, surveillance, uh, and in particular the hydro corridors that I know many of them run through uh, a lot of our wards, uh, and I know it's technically private property, but I know the city of Mississauga also has some trail systems. What are we doing to monitor those areas? Because I know there's so much standing water in, in the corridors, and they back most of them back right onto residential <coughs> areas. So what are we doing to address that in, in the corridors? Nothing, nothing in particular, aside from relying on residents who are adjacent to those areas to let us know about standing water. If, uh, if we do get a complaint, then we will go out and investigate and work with whoever is responsible for the property to make sure that it's well drained. Okay, but it's important to know that the, their first call will really be to Peel region yes. uh, if they have that concern rather than to Ontario Hydro, which typically they never respond to any call whatsoever. Um, uh, when we talk about proactive measures to deal with the mosquitoes, uh, I know it sounds simple, but have we looked at an, um, implementing more bat houses? which is a, is a very natural way to, uh, to manage the mosquito population. Well, I have mixed feelings about bat houses because <laughs> bats are associated with rabies. Mm. And bats are, bats are really the only animal of concern, uh, terrestrial animals, um, at, at least right now in Peel. Uh, and for a number of years, there haven't been any cases of, uh, bat, of uh, rabies in terrestrial animals. There have, however, been uh, cases of rabies in bats. Okay, so we want to stay away from promoting the bat houses as a mosquito right. issue. Um, All righty then, those are my questions. Thank you very much. Good presentation and very timely given the season. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Councillor Toby. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. The um, could could you just can we talk about the Zika virus for for a minute? Because that microcephaly just scares the daylights out of everybody. Because there's no there's no cure. So and I was and, and it, my understanding it's it's transmitted by the tiger mosquito. Uh, it's transmitted by the Aedes uh, aegypti mosquito. I'm not sure if that's the same. It's that's the yeah, yeah that's it. I believe so. Yeah. It. Mm -hmm. yeah. So and it, and it's uh, it is in the U S now. It the, is. The, the uh, Center for Disease Control says it's not really prevalent in Canada, and yet when you look at uh, the dispersal maps for for that particular mosquito, it uh, it does seem as though it does come up into southern Ontario. So are we like when we catch mosquitoes? Are we looking specifically for that one mosquito? So it's important to note that actually we don't have an established population of the mosquito that transmits Zika virus here in Peel, and the mosquitoes that we do look at in our traps, we have never detected a, a right. one of those. Species. But we do actively look for them. I we do. Assume. We do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Thank you, Councillor Starr. I, I guess my question is uh, on the on the testing and the monitoring. Um, and I can give you a personal experience. I was on a late fishing trip, uh, late 2015, and I tested, uh, when I came back, I tested positive for Lyme disease. And yes, I, there are ticks in uh, northern Ontario, and yes, there are the right type up there. Uh, I went on antibiotics and whatever, and then, but uh, my family doctor said there's something wrong here with the with your symptoms and all the rest of it so I went to a communicable uh, disease uh, specialist at one of our great hospitals in Mississauga had him retested but in the US and absolutely no sign of Lyme disease and this particular doctor the specialist said we're having problems in Canada with our testing systems and 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 uh, and I've heard that from one not problem but just false negatives, and, and I'm just wondering uh, is, is this prevalent or is this something that is uh, is an aberration or are other people being tested positive? Because I have another individual the same thing who went through the same process, uh, 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 and then when they sent the the results or blood or whatever to the U.S. 
again, it was a false negative. And, and, and uh, on a secondary test, same thing, false negative. So I'm just wondering, uh, you know, when, when, when we hear about Lyme disease, and I had a personal friend die from that, by the way, um, you know, wh 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 where's the confidence in, in these uh, vector diseases? Yeah, I think the challenge with a lot of the testing, uh, well, so first of all, the the testing strategy that is used in Canada is the same testing strategy that has been verified and confirmed as effective by both Health Canada and the U.S. Federal Drug Administration, um, and so, uh, and, and it's used on both sides of the border. Um, there are additional private laboratories in the United States that use certain unapproved testing methods, um, which on occasion may give different results from the reference testing that is done in Canada and the United States. Um, and so there actually have been some, so there, there has been research into some of these, uh, some of these tests and the, the ability of these tests to actually accurately diagnose or rule out Lyme disease is actually, has actually been called into question. So it's difficult to, it, I'm, I'm not able to speak obviously to the specific cases no. that we see, yeah. but broadly speaking, I think uh, there are a lot of people who do have uh, symptoms that are suggestive of Lyme disease who may not test uh, positive with reference testing here in Canada, but are testing you know, in different, with different results at some of these unapproved private laboratories in the United States. And so, uh, on a case by case basis, the most important thing is for people to sort of see their local, see their family physician, see a communicable disease specialist as you have, and determine if the management they're receiving is the appropriate management for, the, for, for Lyme disease or for whatever entity they may be suffering from. Is there any research or is there any, uh, is there, can you go online and find out? Uh, I mean, I have gone online, by the way, and researched quite a bit, but are there uh, specific uh, sidebars saying, here's what we found that are, are uh, misdiagnosis or aberrations or whatever it is? I, I couldn't quite find that. Anyplace. There is there is academic literature and studies that have looked at the specific laboratories in question in the United States, and those have been published in, in medical journals. Uh -huh. I'm not sure if popular media has covered them, but I'd be happy to share and with yourself or with any members of council uh, if they would be interested in learning more. And by the way, I just was away for a few days and uh, yes, I, uh, I just showed uh, a tick bite that I had already and it doesn't show the, the bullseye. I'm, I'm always become, with our, with, our, with our little fishing group, I've become the expert on Lyme disease. Well, through you, Madam Chair, I would suggest if you have any concerns, you see your primary care provider counselor. I'm fine, thank you. Good advice. <laughs> Thank you very much. Would someone like to move receipt of the presentation? Councillor Gibson and Count Mayor Jeffrey, all those in favor? That's carried. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you, that was thank very you Madam helpful. Chair, and thank you, Councillor. And I'd now like to invite forward Dr. Kate Bingham and Isabel Mock for the next presentation on measles. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, councillors. So we're here to speak to you, uh, to give you an update on two measles cases that we've responded to in 2016. Um, and given that this is a relatively regular event annually, um, to give you a bit of an update on measles and peel. So the management of communicable diseases in public health, uh, the goals really are to prevent and reduce transmission of infectious diseases. We do both case management and contact management um, for 37 reportable diseases, which are common to Ontario and very closely reflect the list of reportable diseases across the country. Um, these include sexually transmitted infections, tuberculosis, meningitis, among many others. And these are required to be reported. They're reported to public health by healthcare providers, um, some of which are, must be reported even on the suspicion of the infection rather than waiting for confirmatory testing, um, and are also reported to us uh, through labs, uh, both from the hospital, the private labs, and public health lab. In 2015, we responded to over 6,000 cases of reportable infections. Some of these require fairly minimal follow-up, and some of them, as you'll see, require quite extensive follow-up. So the action uh, required for each of those was quite variable. Uh, the contact management component, so within the case management, 
we uh, we provide 24/7 coverage for for any urgent response that's required, both for case and contact management. Um, in conjunction with health, the healthcare providers and the, and or the hospital for the case, we ensure that the the diagnosis is indeed confirmed or that the suspicion is uh, reasonable, that the appropriate testing has been done, and we can provide education if if additional testing is required. Um, we ensure that the case is isolated as appropriate if that's required um, and that they have been connected to the appropriate treatment and follow-up. For the contacts, we then try to identify anyone who the case has been in contact with who might require intervention. So some of these uh, diseases, as you'll see, measles included, there are actually preventative measures that can be taken within a relatively short period of time to reduce the likelihood that any contacts would become infected um, or to reduce the severity of the infection if, uh, if they did happen to become ill with, uh, with that disease. And so the contact management really, it always involves education and sometimes does involve intervention. So globally, measles is still uh, a very serious infection. It's the leading cause of death uh, a young, among young children globally. Uh, certainly the leading cause of vaccine preventable death among young children globally. Canada has been free of endemic measles since 1998. So even one case in Canada is cause for an, an urgent and immediate response and a very detailed investigation as to where that case may have come from. Um, in Ontario, there were 42 cases of measles reported uh, from 2014 to 2015, and all were associated with uh, inadequate immunization and or uh, travel outside of Canada, often because the individuals were um, under one year of age, which is the age at which the first routine dose of uh, measles uh, vaccine is administered in Ontario. In 2016, there were three cases of measles reported thus far, and two of those cases have been in Peel. So many people here may have had some personal experience with measles, um, and uh, that may have varied from a, a relatively mild but uncomfortable, certainly uncomfortable infection to, uh, to quite severe, possibly requiring hospitalization. Um, measles is not really not just another childhood illness. It was certainly a common childhood illness before the um, routine immunization was introduced, um, but uh, it can result in very serious disease. It's transmitted through airborne droplets, which is part of the problem. <laughs> it's very, very infectious, um, and it's transmitted through the air, whereas most of the infections that we all commonly get, like the cold or the flu, is actually really droplet you need to come in contact with the, the droplets that people have coughed or sneezed into the air and, and onto a surface and then sort of you touch the surface or the droplet and touch your own mucous membranes and become infected. Measles is one of the few diseases that can actually hang around in the air. And in fact, uh, for those people who are susceptible to measles, they can become infected by simply being in the same room as someone who has measles or in that room up to two hours after that individual has left the airspace. Um, and it's also very, a very effective disease at being transmitted. So mm, it, amongst maybe 10 people who are susceptible to measles, eight, seven, eight, or nine of those will become infected just by being in, in the proximity of someone who's transmitting it. So highly infectious, which makes it really challenging to control in populations who are not highly immunized. And it's why we still see the occasional case here um, in Ontario, despite having very good immunization rates. It's contagious beginning four days before the rash appears, and it begins looking a lot like a cold, which is another challenge. Uh, so you're, before it's uh, clear that you have measles, you can actually be transmitting the virus. Starts with cold-like symptoms and a fever, often involves red, sore eyes, which many of us see in, in a lot of the cold, uh, cold viruses that we see in small children. And then this sort of characteristic rash begins. In some cases, complications can include dehydration, requiring uh, severe enough sometimes to require uh, hospitalization, particularly for young children, um, pneumonia, and in rare cases, an inflammation of the brain called encephalitis, and that can sometimes result in permanent disability, such as hearing loss or, or brain damage. And there are a number of other, uh, there's a, a serious neurodegenerative disease that, that very rarely occurs um, sometime after the infection has actually resolved. Thank you. So, immunization is the best protection. Two doses of measles vaccine are recommended for anyone born in 1970 or later. 
That's because those of us born before 1970 probably had measles before immunization was developed and became um, prevalent. So the first vaccine dose routinely is given on or after the per first birthday. The second dose at ages four to six as children start to go to school. In um, Peel, we are proud to report that our current rate for our Peel children is 98% coverage. And we have sustained a high coverage rate, over 90%, since 2009, which is very good. Um, as you know, the um, Legislation Immunization School Pupils Act requires children in Ontario to have immunizations, several of them, to attend school. Because of our high rate of coverage, we have what is known as herd immunity that helps protect those in our population who cannot be immunized or whose immunity may be weakened. Those at higher risk are our post-secondary students because they're in college, university, or in um, communities where there is high density of people. Travelers who go to countries that are endemic for the measles virus. Healthcare workers, because healthcare workers are working with people who may be compromised in their health. And then those who are immune compromised themselves, for example, someone who is on chemotherapy for cancer. So to give you a little bit more information about the cases that we've responded to this year, um, and they're quite similar to many of the cases that we've seen in the past. Um, we had a case reported uh, for Peel resident in January and a second one reported again in March. In both cases, these uh, infants were under one year of age or just about one year of age um, and were not yet fully immunized. In the case in January, uh, the infant had actually received one dose of measles containing vaccine, although uh, very, very shortly before symptoms had started, so not yet necessarily effective. Um, and it was concurrent, happened concurrent with uh, travel to a measles endemic country. So in both cases, the infants had, were, um, were traveling to countries where measles circulates widely. And as I described the, how infectious measles is to you, uh, it makes it very challenging to achieve herd immunity that, that Isabel has uh, discussed. So you need very, very high rates of vaccination to actually achieve that her herd immunity or that protection for those who might be susceptible, young infants, immunocompromised, et cetera. In both cases, there were several exposure sites in Peel, so these individuals were identified in hospital and where the diagnosis was actually made. But as is commonly the case, they'd been sick for a number of days before that, and it was during the infectious period and had traveled, had gone around to a number of different sites. Usually we see they've, they've been seen often by their family doctor or a walk-in clinic, or they've attended another hospital or healthcare facility during that period. And then because they're small, they've gone along with their families on grocery shopping or um, other, other settings where the potential for transmission exists to a large group of individuals. So in the first case, Peel Health um, followed up 338 contacts, and in the second case, we followed up almost 500 contacts. So the public health actions when we receive the, a report of measles include a media release about public exposure settings where appropriate. So for malls, and we include the hospital exposures there because it's not always possible to track everyone down based on just the, the patient lists that we have access to. For those individuals where we actually have a name, so other patients who were registered in the clinic or in the emergency department in the window of time where the case was um, sharing the same airspace, we make an a vigorous attempts to contact those individuals by phone and letter contact to let them know that they've been exposed, to give them some information about the measles, how they know whether they're susceptible or not, and some um, a phone number to, to contact us so that we can go through more extensive follow-up with them. Certain individuals, such as healthcare workers, school teachers, and child care workers, and, and first responders, are, need to actually be excluded from their workplaces because they're in touch, they're in contact with highly susceptible individuals, um, until we have proof of immunity from them. And that can, there's uh, various ways that they can provide that. And many of those, so myself included, for my clinical work, you usually have that on file with their employers, and it's able to um, 
to get that taken care of relatively quickly. Um, and for those who are eligible, um, we can provide post-exposure treatment to try to prevent them from getting measles given that they've been exposed um, if they're susceptible. So our next steps are to continue our comprehensive screening of immunization records for school-aged children. We screen more than 250,000 records of school students every year. Includes our two large peel boards, as well as French language schools, as well as private schools. The, we will continue to encourage immunization prior to travel to measles endemic countries. The um, travel-related illness with measles is really the way that we're um, getting the cases in Peel. So we are looking at strategies to increase um, our community's knowledge before they go to a country that has measles endemically to make sure their immunizations are up to date, particularly in small children and a, and a child that is under a year old can receive the immunization before they leave, which would decrease their chances of obtaining that disease while they're away. We also are um, developing strategies to enhance community partnerships to protect our population in public settings. When someone is in emergency and they're waiting there and they have measles, it can spread very quickly, which is why we do all of those follow-ups of um, our population who have been in doctor's offices, clinics, emergency departments, and, um, and also, of course, we're working with our, our schools on a regular regular basis. So all of that will continue. Um, on June 23rd, we will be coming back to you with a report about Peel and travel-related illnesses. And we can tell you more about what we've been doing in regard to this um, way of the disease being transmitted. So thank you. Thank you very much. We have one speaker, Councillor Starr. Yeah, the question I have is uh, goes back to the uh, slide where it indicated you had 6,200 case management. Um, t tell me the the relationship between. I mean, how do how do you get those? I mean, uh, what's the overall picture? You go to a clinic, you go to a doctor. Do the, are they required to report? Uh, I mean, I guess what's the reporting system? The monitoring? What's the interface between all these various outside bodies? and say Peel Health. So through the chair, um, so the, they're, they are required. So there's legislation requiring healthcare providers to report um, any list on any disease on the list of communicable diseases. So there's a there's this list of um, 37 reportable diseases. They're called reportable diseases in Ontario, um, and. Some you are required to report immediately, even on suspicion of the disease, and then others can be reported sort of within the next working day by fax. And they, they all come in centrally to um, Peel Public Health, and we have a system for triaging them to the appropriate program area. Um, and ones that require urgent response obviously come straight to the top of the list, and, um, and we can begin to act on those immediately. But uh, it's part of part of physician training to be aware of their legislative responsibilities to report those diseases. The other, um, the other group that reports to us is from the labs. So when people do testing and there's a confirmatory test for any of the reportable diseases, the lab will report that directly to us, either by fax or by phone, depending on the infection. And the second step or level down is all the personal care workers and those folks visiting in-home care and um, some of them are professional, some of them aren't. Where, where, where is, the, is there a gap there? So you, you do need to be able to, be a, to make diagnosis. So some of those workers would not necessarily, within their scope of practice, be able to diagnose infections. So there's no reporting requirement at that level. Um, but with the hosp we have a, it's a fairly robust reporting requirement, certainly through physicians and through the hospitals. So the infection prevention and control teams in the hospitals will also report to us, um, sometimes on behalf of the physicians. I'm not talking about the hospital. I'm talking about all the personal care workers, yeah, which so, are so thousands no. out there on a daily basis, uh, tending to the care of those uh, in home, for instance, and and. Uh, 
So no, they're not included in this structure because they don't diagnose as part of their scope of practice. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Starr, would you like to move receipt of the delegation and the report uh, on both of these? Uh, seeing no more questions, all those in favor? That's carried. Thank you very much for Thank the presentation. You. Members of Council, there are two items of communication. The first is for referral, and the second is for receipt. Are there any questions on either one of these reports? Councillor Downey. Thank you, through you, Chair, to Dr. DeVille. I'm just wondering, uh, in item 7.1, what the current funding model looks like for this program? So yes, through the chair. Thank you for the question, Councillor Downey. So we're talking about the Healthy Babies, Healthy Children program, which is currently um, what's considered a 100% funded program, courtesy of the Ministry of Children and Youth. Uh, the interesting thing is, is that this is a program uh, that we've advised Council of uh, over the years through the budget process. It is considered a 100% funded program, courtesy of the province. However, it's 100% of the allocated approved amount. Um, unfortunately, that funding level has been frozen for us. We have not received any increases in respect of that funding since 2008. So it's 100% funded to the level that the province is funding. Um, and we have every single year, as we continue to communicate with the province in respect of budgetary allowances, um, communicated that this is insufficient for us to meet the needs of our population. So we're interested in participating absolutely in this review process and again, making our views known about this program and uh, the kind of funding it actually needs in order for us to be able to deliver uh, to the most vulnerable members of our population. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to move referral of one and receipt of the other moved by Councillor Downey? All those in favour? That's carried. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Um, items related to human services, Councillor Miles, if you'd chair this section. Mr. Chairman, so members of Council, the first report is here for your information. Sorry. Wrong tab. Yes, the report is here for your information. It's on the Local Employment Planning Council. Any questions? Seeing none, I'll take a motion then to receive the report. Moved by Councillor Gibson, seconded by Mayor Crombie. All in favor? That's carried. The second item is for your, it, there is a recommendation on this one. It's um, requesting that the province of Ontario include Peel in the basic income guarantee pilot project. And I do have a couple of people on the board. Mayor Crombie first. Thank you. Um, it looks like an interesting pilot project. I just wondered how realistic it was that we participate and who else is part of the pilot. Do we know anything more? Through the chair. At this point, we don't have any details. The announcement was made in the budget, and we're awaiting further information from the ministry. So that's been a few months now. So they haven't sent out any further information, or how many communities would be involved, or you know. through the share. No, at this point, we haven't we received know. anything. So we're just going to apply to be part of the pilot part of the program. Okay. Well, happy to move it. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor Moore. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I just uh, would like to confirm that uh, if the Region of Peel is selected as part of a, a pilot project, that um, while this may fall under the, the umbrella of human services, there's certainly a correlation between housing, and income, and health, and that it is something that would be monitored and tracked uh, by the Health Department as well. I think that that would be a key component to uh, to any pilot project to make sure we have a, a complete and accurate picture. Through the chair, just to confirm that we do recognize the complexity of a pilot project such as this, and we would be working very closely with health, other departments, and our community partners. Terrific. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councillor Unique. Thank you. Briefly, just a, a cautionary note. I mean, I'm, I'm willing to look at it, but I'm, I'm getting fed up of the, this tendency of the province to tell us, hey, we've got a great idea and we're going to look at something like basic income guarantee and why don't we bring you into the tent, which really means, uh, did you bring your checkbook? 
So it was just a week ago, hey, we've got this great idea, inclusionary zoning, we'll let you spend money on housing, isn't that great? And I think it's the thin edge of the wedge where we should be saying, we're not interested, it's a social, why don't you, that have 92% of all the money, the province, the fa why don't you pay for it? We don't need you to tell us that we could have been paying for it all along. And that's what these seem to be becoming. So you've heard me say it before, I say it again. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Unica. So the report and recommendation has been moved by Mayor Crombie, seconded by Councillor Moore. All in favor? That's carried. Um, we do have items of communication on the affordable transportation um, pilot project. Um, so that would be N, uh, N1 and 2. Mm -hmm. It's here for your information. Moved by moved by Councillor Sato. Councillor Sato, the last item, 9.2.1, I think relates to what you wanted. Oh, you wanted to start. Okay, okay. Councillor Sato. Thank you. Um, yeah, I want to speak to the additional item that I asked to come on, but also I'd like to speak to this. Um, just <coughs> checking with, um, with clerks, did you receive the motion from the City of Mississauga with regard to the affordable transportation? Uh, we had made a request in our motion that um, that the full funding uh, for the project or the bulk of the funding come through the region of Peel, and that was to have been sent to council for deliberation. May, through the chair, yes, we did receive that motion, and we will be bringing it to the next council meeting. Okay, I, I guess it would have helped it have been on today with the Brampton um, resolution. It sounds as if... Um, and, and that's fine. We, we can deal with that the next one. But it sounds as if Brampton is interested um, endorsing the motion and wanting to partner with Peel. And in Mississauga, just to, to maybe have our Brampton uh, counterparts um, think about this, that uh, th this is a social service, providing people with the, uh, the opportunity to get to work. And the first program was... Uh, it did receive significant funding through the region. It did get provincial as well, but um, and the way the program is uh, is tailored, the almost the full cost of the program is uh, is on the city of Mississauga, and it's it's more of a social service than it is a transportation because it's serving um, those at risk and those in need, in the greatest need. So uh, when it comes forward. Um, I, I would ask that Council consider the request from the City of Mississauga and perhaps Brampton can be considering this as well. In the meantime, that uh, we should be looking at the, uh, the bulk of the funding for this coming through the regional social service budget um, with the lesser amount coming from the municipalities. The amount that we had approved was to get the pilot up and running, which was just for the administration. And I said at the time, and we, we uh, passed that motion at City Council that, um, that that's just not the way it should be done. So I'd, I'd like to put um, that on notice and um, perhaps Mayor Jeffrey, your council could, uh, could consider that. Well, thank you. Okay. So uh, I'll take a motion um, from Councillor Sato to receive um, correspondence 9.1 and 9. 9.12. Uh, moved by Councillor Sato, seconded by Councillor Moore. All in favour? That's carried. Um, the next item is 9.2, and I'm wondering if you wanted to speak to this in regards to uh, the issue as well that from, um, Parrish. yeah, Councillor Parrish. Thank, thank you, and um, sorry, I had missed that it was on 9.2. Um, when she sent me the email, so I, I added it onto the agenda. I guess I really didn't have to. Um, Councillor Parrish had um, had sent me a message because she was going to be away, and uh, she has asked me to inquire um, if the region and perhaps direction be given to staff today um, to look into purchasing the school sites that are being closed. She apparently has um, discussed with with Habitat and they are prepared to do seniors housing and daycare and keep the housing in um, perpetuity so that it does remain affordable 
She's also um, uh, asking um, the minister, uh, Charles Sousa, to see if the province would be interested in waiving the payment. And apparently they would only have to transfer a small portion of money to the school boards if, um, if they waived the payment in order that uh, housing could be built on those properties. So um, I, I agreed that I would raise it today. And I, I guess what we, um, what I would ask that we do is perhaps give direction to, um, to staff to pursue the request and to um, uh, work with the ministry to see if that is something that would be feasible. So I would uh, I would put that forward as a motion on her behalf. There's no real decision being made today. It's just pursuing it. Um, I'm wondering if we. Uh I, I can tell by the silence around the room that people are a little bit concerned about dealing with this motion without really knowing the implications of it. Well, it's just a, it's really just a direction for staff to uh, to investigate um, the the feasibility and then report back to council. It's certainly not directing staff to take any action except do investigation and report back. Oh, I see the. Um the, the Commissioner of Human Resources and the CAO are on the board. So, thank you. Just, just clarification. We are on the uh, surplus school board circulation, so we will be considering those properties. I'm assuming you're referring to St. Dunstan and St. Gertrude? Yes, that, those are the two that she mentioned. So, we would be reviewing and considering those properties for potential housing or okay. development as part of our usual process. Okay. So I, I think what she's asking is that um, the staff report back, and she was very specific with those two properties. So I guess it could just be direction to staff to report on what you're reviewing then. Okay. Mr. Swark? I was just going to confirm the same thing, and uh, we'll just take that as direction and report yep. back on those two specific schools. Okay. And thanks. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll take a motion then to receive um, correspondence 9.2.1, moved by Councillor Tovey, seconded by Councillor Thompson. All in favour? That's carried. Uh, back to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, items related to enterprise programs and services. Councillor Fonseca, if you chair this section, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, item 10.1 is procurement activity quarterly report, along with uh, this is for information. Moved by Councillor Unica, seconded by Mayor Thompson. All in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Um, item 10.2 is funding of capped tax increases for 2016 and this a bylaw has to be established seeing no questions moved by mayor thompson seconded by mayor crombie all in favor any opposed carried item 10.3 is heels labor market update i believe there this is for information and i believe there's a presentation Morning. Thank you, Madam Chair, Regional Councillors. I am pleased to be here this morning to present an overview of conditions in Peel's labour market for data up to the end of 2015. And before I begin the presentation, I'd like to define what I speak about when I speak about Peel's labour market. This describes Peel's residents who are of working age and who are either looking for work or working inside or outside of Peel. In 2015, there was strong growth in Peel's labor market. And as a result, uh, there were about 
818,000 Peel's residents who were actually in the labor market. Of this, 92% approximately, or 755,000, were successful in finding employment. At this level, as you can see, the size of Peel's labor market was larger than it was uh, in 2007 before the recession, both in terms of the residents who are in the market looking for work and also those who are working. Since the recovery started, uh, the labor market recovery started in 2010, the annual change in employment has been relatively weak. But in 2015, there was really strong growth, both in terms of the residents entering the labor market and, as you can see, employment. Approximately 150,000 residents entered the labor market in 2015, of which uh, 141,000 were successful in finding employment. Uh, with that, the number of positions lost in, during the recession, those were recovered. As you can recall, during the recession in 2008-2009, approximately 96,000 jobs were lost in Peel's labor market. Uh, with the strong performance in 2015, we have recovered all those positions uh, with an additional over 100,000 positions. However, as we will see later in the presentation, the, 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 the number of persons unemployed in Peel in 2015, there were, 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 there were more people unemployed in Peel in 2015 <laughs> relative to before the recession. But with regard to the change that we saw in 2015, growth occurred throughout the labor market. They were broad-based, all the major subcategories of employment showed growth. But if we are to look more in depth at it, growth was led by full-time employment, particularly in the service sector. When you look at it by class, the private sector continued to have the highest number of jobs, but self-employment continued to increase. If we look at it in terms of the age group, Adults account for the highest number of jobs gained in 2015, but, but the youth labor market also benefited. And with the relatively strong growth that we saw in 2015, Peel's annual average unemployment rate fell from 8.1% in 2014 to 7.7% in 2015. This decline was a result of lower unemployment rates, both among adults, which is 25 years and over, as well as youth, 15 to 25 years old. This slide shows an additional two labor market indicators. Uh, for the unemployment rate, it only accounts for people who are actually in the labor market and looking for work. If you are not working and you are not looking, you are not counted as part of the unemployed. These two indicators are the employment rate and the participation rate. And it is a proportion of the working age population, whether or not you're looking for work. And uh, just in terms of definition, the employment rate describes the proportion of working age residents who are employed while the participation rate describes the proportion of working age population who are employed or looking for work. And the, the trend in these two variables are similar to the unemployment rate, where there were uh, increases uh, relative to the preceding year. But when you view it against where it was in 27 before the recession, they are lower. And what does that mean? I said before that the number of jobs lost, we have recovered more. What it means is that although employment is growing, residents are finding jobs, the rate at which they're finding jobs is less than the rate of growth in the 
the, the, the working age population. It means that still there's a higher number of persons in Peel who are not working in 2015 relative to before the recession. Now I turn to some trends that we saw and we have been keeping a track of since the recession. And we look at how these change uh, in 2015. The first one is a look at the employment by type. Since the recession, what we have seen is stronger growth in part-time employment. Well, in 2015, we had the reverse, where the full-time employment was driving growth. And as such, as we can see, uh, full-time employment has gained in terms of the proportion of employment in Peel. However, again, if you look relative to where it was in 27, 2007, part-time employment is still higher than it was prior to the recession. The Self-employment continues to grow, and again, in 2015, it has increased to absorb more of the, job, the employment in Peel. With regard to services, there has been a long-term shift, sorry, in, in terms of uh, the, the composition of our em employment, there has been a long-term shift away from services to away from goods producing sector, sorry, to services. Uh, in 2015, 80% of our residents were employed in services, 20% in the goods producing sector. A part of this over the long term has been the downward trend in manufacturing. And if you recall, in 2002 to 2003, about a quarter of the Peel's labor market was in manufacturing. In 2015, that went down to one eighth. So that has been part of the, the shift. Uh, now, when we see shifts towards services, there is always the talk of a shift in income, to lower income. And there's credence to that, because if you look at the hourly wage rate paid by the goods sector versus the services sector, Yes, there's a difference, and the goods sector pays more. However, if we look over the long term, that gap between the two sectors, that has been declining. Notwithstanding that, we took a look at the change in the composition of jobs gained in 2015 in Peel. And what we saw was 48%, almost a half, of the jobs that residents found in 2015 were in three sectors. They were in transportation and warehousing, trade, and accommodation and food services. Well, those three sectors are not among the top 10 in terms of hourly wage rate. So there may have been some shifts in income. So having presented all of this, what is the picture for Peel's labor market? It was mixed. We saw strong growth in 2015, and that resulted in a recovery of the number of positions which were lost during the recession. And in addition to this, we now have first quarter 2016 data, which shows that the improvements continued into 2016. However, there are challenges. The growth in jobs was not sufficient to accommodate the workers who lost jobs during the recession, in addition to those who are coming into the, the, the labor market. Uh, there were, as a result of that, there were more unemployed residents in 2015 relative to before the recession. And despite the decline that we saw in terms of part-time employment in 2015 relative to 2014, it's still at an elevated level, and the shift in self-employment uh, continued. Finally, those who found jobs, a lot of them found jobs in sectors which are still going to make them employed, but still vulnerable to low income. Now, under the reduced poverty and employment term of council priority, strategies are being developed to help to address some of these issues. Uh, staff of the re at the region will continue to work with 
the local municipalities to continue work on looking at and understanding the changes, changes in employment as well as labor market conditions in Peel. Uh, regional staff will also monitor federal, provincial, and local initiatives and discussion around some programs like guaranteed income, as these may have very uh, strong implications for many of Peel's residents who are currently employed, but they are still vulnerable to low income. So that ends my presentation. If there are any questions, I'm willing to take them at this time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for the presentation, Judith. We do have some questions. Uh, Mayor Crombie. Judith, I just want to say thank you. I thought that was a terrific overview of our labor market. I read it with great interest uh, when I read my binder. It's obvious that we still haven't fully recovered from the effects of the, of the recession back from 2007 and 2008 and the shift to increasingly to the service sector where there are lower wages is increasingly concerning too. Uh, adult uh, unemployment is decreased, so that's great, 6.1. And even though youth unemployment is decreased, it's still at staggering rates. It's still over, what, 60, almost 17 percent. So yes. even though it's decreased, it's still very, very high. I wonder what strategies we have in place for our youth unemployment. Or are we just focused on the, the num we're just doing the overview? Are there strategies in place? Uh, through the chair, if I may. So we do continue with our youth employment program each summer, and we have also changed the focus on our employment services towards harder to employ individuals. Uh, previously, we were running the gamut from job ready to those who have individuals who had barriers to employment, but we are now focusing much more on individuals that require intensive supports. So that should support our youth as well. We have um, a healthy city stewardship initiative in Mississauga, along with a number of other stakeholders, organizations, and uh, Trillium Health Center uh, with our CEO, Michelle Demanuel. And we've applied for a grant to deal with um, youth unemployment, and we were successful. So hopefully some of the strategies we're able to put in place will we can share with the region of Peel. Thank you. OK, thank you. And Councillor Russ? Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for your presentation, Judith. Over here. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's okay, I'm short. Um, I think for the most part, this, uh, given what we've seen over the last few years, this is a very strong report, so I'm, I'm pleased to see that. Um, it also kind of uh, lends itself to we have a fairly robust economy. We're not particularly uh, reliant on one uh, industry or, or type of job. Um, what I'm seeing an increase in self uh, self employment clearly, and I'm just wondering: Are now now that we have this information, are we reaching out to the economic development departments and the boards of trade? What are we doing to say that uh, you know these are the tr th this is the information that we're seeing? What are you doing to help support this growing sector of the economy? Uh, well, currently we have a Peel um, Employment Working Group that we are working together with. We have members from the area municipalities, and so the information is transmitted. We are discussing it. With regard to the Board of Trade, I am scheduled to speak to them, present the information at some time. Um, with our, our policy group is, is uh, putting that together. So I'll be speaking with them, presenting this information at some time. OK, that's good yeah. to hear. And also, do you take these labor market trends and look at the mobility patterns of where our, um, where our workforce is, is going, whether in, within, the, within, within the region or outside of the region? And is that a possibility? Because I think that will lend itself to future transportation policies and where we develop our, our networks. Okay, the labor market information itself, we do not do that with it in year, but in census years, when we're able to get a lot more cross tabs, we are able to do that. <laughs> and uh, can't read my writing here. Uh, no, that's good. Thank you very much. It was a good report. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Mayor Thompson. Excellent report. I was talking to some business people yesterday morning. So I found this report when I went through it uh, later yesterday that was uh, really caught my eye. The one thing that you find is you're quite right. There's two things I got to say is the uh, manufacturing's live and well, but it's robotics. It's just one particular individual. Uh, four <coughs> years ago, 
was himself and two others. He's now up to 34, and he needs to get six more people to keep up with the demand. He just, they're working long hours. They work until midnight some nights just to get the job done for the day before they can go home. So he, he said, you know, that market is growing, which is interesting. That's called intelligent manufacturing. But it was interesting, talking to a couple others, they're self-employed because they have worked, and with the job cuts, they start their own business. The challenge they're finding is, it's the financial markets that are not supporting the self-employed. Because you know, knew you're high risk, they're having to, they just can't get operating loans and operating credit because the banks don't understand. They want to give you a mortgage on your house, but they don't want to give, you know, invest in the businesses that could create jobs. They could hire more people, but they just don't have the cash flow to make it work. And, I, and the interesting thing is, is what they're finding is, uh, starting out is, they said they're living really poor, more than they ever have. You know, they're not replacing the family car, they're not doing anything because they're putting it all into the business. So it's, you, when, you were, when I caught that, I noticed that, you know, the, the class of income's coming down is just because there isn't bankable ability to help with the self-employment. And uh, so I just thought I'd just add that in. But it was interesting to hear that conversation yesterday morning. Then I read your report there at noon hour, and I thought, wow, you know, that's really interesting to see how that all ties together. But I just thought I'd just share that intel with you. Very good report, as everybody else has said. Thank you, Thank Judith. You. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor, moved by Councillor Ross, seconded by Mayor Thompson. All in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Um, item 10.4 is the 9th Line Lands Regional Official Plan Amendment. Councillor McFadden. Well, thank you. Um, uh, 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 sorry, Madam Chair, for that. Um, this has been a, an extremely extremely long process and I'm glad I'm a woman of patience. Um, this has had, uh, this is a prime example of collaboration between our city staff and our regional staff and it's, uh, I have to say special thanks to Arvin and uh, from the region and uh, Frank and Andrew at the city working so well together to get this to this point. The timelines are very aggressive <coughs> and I'm hoping that that little chart will be kept up and uh, because our Meetings are next month on the 6th and 8th to get public input on the ninth line land use. Um, but it's really unfortunate when we have the MTO causing the type of problems that they're causing along this corridor. But saying that, I'm hoping that uh, they come and show their face at some of these meetings so that they can answer some of the questions that our homeowners and uh, landowners around that area can uh, get some answers to. So thank you again for all the hard work on this, and I look forward to the uh, final report at the end of this year. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Councillor McFadden. Councillor Sato. Thank you. We, we've had these lands so long that the covenant, I think, expires next year that, uh, that the province put on the lands when we bought them. Um, be best purchase, I think, we've ever made in the city of Mississauga for what we paid for the lands that we own. But, um, you know, Armin, um, I'm glad we're, we're getting where we are, but you know how long it has taken. I had really wanted this to be part of ROPA 24, and you, you convinced us that uh, you couldn't do that, that it wasn't something that we should be opening up ROPA 24 with all the other issues in it that um, to put it in. But, um, you know, having staff work parallel with the city is vitally important. And um, I, I think there has been good collaboration, and we have, I guess, the, the visioning session is June 6th in my ward, and June, is it the 8th, in, uh, in Sue's ward. So um, we're hoping that we will have lots of residents come out. And uh, we know a lot of the vision is you don't do anything on the land, and they have to recognize there already is an official plan on the land um, that belongs to the region of Halton that, uh, that we had to assume. So I think we can probably, having gone through that process and you know what that was, I think we can probably come up with a better vision than was on the lands during um, when Halton did it. And as uh, Councilor McFadden has said, working with the province through this process for the last, what, 15 years has not been easy <laughs> at all. And they just keep coming back and saying, well, you know, for the transit way, well, you know, we needed this amount of land, but, uh, you know, now we think we might need more. And the parcels of land that are actually usable are getting smaller and smaller. 
and I feel really bad for the uh, for the ninth line owners who had a whole chunk of their land taken away by the 407 and were not um, were not compensated properly for it and I'm hoping that they won't have even more taken away uh, for the transit way which is vital to uh, to movement in the northwest part of the city but um, you know they, they have not been treated well and I know uh, Sue that has inherited all of those ninth line uh, homeowners association is taking good care of them <laughs> and uh, that you know we'll make sure that they um, that they're treated fairly because that's vitally important now especially now that they are part of the city of Mississauga thank you okay thank you Councillor Sato uh, Mayor Thompson yeah. first of all uh, Councillor Sato and Councillor uh, McFadden I, I feel your pain um, you know, this is the challenge that Callan goes through every time we do something in Highway 10. Uh, we still have land still frozen yet. Um, the good news is we did have a meeting uh, the day we did meet with the minister. We did meet with staff ahead of time with the region staff. And I think we're starting to make some headway. I think they're starting to realize they need to have people in the process. But it's lengthy. And uh, I guess, Madam Chairman, if I could, I would like to ask a question to Arvin, if yeah. I could. Arvin, yes. maybe you need to, uh, could you please explain the process on why this takes as long as it does? Because this is Caledon's challenge as well. I know Mississauga's feeling it too. But maybe it's good just to kind of give a quick Reader's Digest version, just what the process, why the process has to take so long. Yes, uh, through you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Do Mayor Thompson, uh, I think I've been asked this question a few times over the years at Regional <laughs> Council, and uh, I think my answer pretty much stays the same, is that uh, planning is a very complex matter. There's multiple stakeholders involved in the ninth line lands, for example. The province was very much uh, involved in uh, planning for a transit uh, corridor uh, across the ninth line, and some of the thinking of City Council in Mississauga was way ahead of the province on, on the land. So the province wasn't even, you know, they had slated some lands aside for transit way, but they hadn't really thought it through. So when we brought the ninth line lands forward, is the province had to play catch up and, and that takes time. Also, it's a um, multi-stakeholder type of uh, initiative. So uh, there's a lot of people, as uh, Councillor Sato has said, who want to see absolutely nothing done on this property. But there's even more people who really see the economic potential and the benefits it can bring to, to the city and to the region of Peel. And it's, uh, so it's, you know, uh, competing interests, bringing competing interests together that really takes a lot of time. Not to mention uh, on this particular piece, all the work around stormwater, um, the, four, the, the 400 series highways, both the uh, 407 and a portion of the 401 have stormwater facilities in these lands. So um, that, that really took the gross developable area and reduced it down significantly. So it wasn't just a transit way, it was a stormwater, it was in other environmental features. Working through all of those issues can be very, very timely. Um, but um, you know, as we have proven in the past with other boundary expansions, uh, think of Mayfield West, for example, uh, it, it pays off and uh, we can build really good communities. But the work we're doing uh, in planning to get us to that point is an investment in good community planning. Okay, thank you. Anything further, Mayor Thompson? Uh, Councillor McFadden, you're on the... Oh, thank board. you. I just wanted to um, go on that again, that um, the MTO, I'm surprised that they um, are, are asking for the amount of surface parking that they're asking for, for that transit way. I'm just appalled that in this day and age of making sure that we don't have a lot of concrete, that they're still insisting on parking for 2,000 cars at the corner of Derry and the 407. Um, I have no problem with parking, but go up and, and nice. leave things alone. But on um, the part of the ninth line homeowners, I think they've been prepared um, for the last 10 years that something will be going 
along that corridor, but I think it, it's a balance. And I think both Councillor Sato and myself have encouraged the community to be prepared to have some sort of development, but there are er areas that have floodplain and we'll make that recreational um, you know, land. But uh, I think the meetings will go well. Um, I'll wear my bulletproof vest, but um, you know, of course, we'll we'll make sure that it's a balance between what they want and what is feasible for the city. Well said. Thank you. So you will move that with patience. Finally, moving along with the next step in the process. M moved by Councillor McFadden, second by Councillor Sato. All in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Um, 10.5 is a referral from audit and risk. It's a, a presentation by Michelle Morris and I believe Anila Lalani are here to do a presentation. Good morning. Morning. I wasn't sure if we were going to make the morning or afternoon. I know, I've had to look at the clock. So in my speaking notes, it says morning slash afternoon. So <laughs> good morning, Madam Chair and members of council. My name is Michelle Morris and I'm the Director of Internal Audit. And with me today is Anila Leilani, who's our advisor, Integrated Risk Management. And she will be co-presenting with me today. The region of Peel is one of the few municipalities within Canada to have launched an integrated risk management program. We officially launched in 2011, and we have completed significant steps to embed risk management within our existing planning and decision-making processes. Today's presentation represents another major milestone, which is the development and communication of the region's risk appetite. Our presentation for today will include some background information on integrated risk management, which we call IRM, also known in industry of enterprise risk management, ERM. Our approach to risk management, which will include some information on key milestones to date. We will define risk appetite and how it relates to the region, the region stakeholders and the benefits of establishing a risk appetite. We will also take some time to review our proposed risk principles and philosophy, which will provide guidance to management and staff for decision making. Finally, we will provide the proposed risk appetite for Council's review and approval. And we recognize that it, this is our first time going through this information with Council. The Audit and Risk Committee received this information on May 5th. So should you have any questions, we will open up for questions at the end of our presentation. Risk management is considered a leading practice for managing and monitoring risk, with financial institutions being early adopters. For private sector organization, risk management is intended to help an organization meet its objectives while managing risks that may impact those objectives, maximizing profits and value. For public sector organizations, risk management has the same goal of meeting objectives while managing risk. It is intended to increase the performance of the government's program or service and allows management to navigate with a better sense of when to move forward and when to pull back. As stated earlier, IRM was launched in 2011 with the goal to develop a systematic approach to manage and monitor risk. The region developed its integrated risk management framework based on the international standards organization ISO 31000 risk management. And ISO is a worldwide federation of national standards bodies. So where are we now? We have taken significant steps to advance risk management practices and principles. We have an established framework we have processes that are used to facilitate risk assessments. We have risk management categories that allow for various risks to be considered through a risk assessment, as well as for the aggregation of risks. An IRM policy 
was approved by the Audit and Risk Committee in November 2013, and it lays out the roles and responsibilities for risk management at the region. The region has conducted several pilot risk assessments that assisted program areas to identify their risk and mitigation techniques and allowed the region to assess the effectiveness of the framework and processes. Risk assessments that have been completed and presented to the Audit and Risk Committee include privacy, PAMA security, new water billing system in public works, and most recently, the integrated planning framework, to name a few. After achieving these milestones, our next steps included setting up a clearly articulated risk appetite and integrate risk management into decision-making processes. This presentation provides information on the setting of a risk appetite for the Region of Peel's strategic plan and term of council priorities. Setting risk appetite is a core element within integrated risk management and allows an organization to openly communicate its views on risk. All organizations are exposed to risk as they pursue their strategic and operational objectives. An organization can be deliberate as it in the risk it pursues. The more risk an organization takes on can allow the organization to reap the rewards. However, taking on too much risk can expose an organization to greater losses. On the flip side, taking on too little risk can prevent an organization from achieving its value proposition and objectives and miss out on potential opportunities. Risk appetite setting allows an organization to align risk taking with the stakeholders' expectation on how much risk an organization should take on as it pursues its objectives and balance risk taking with the value being pursued. The 2015 and 2016 Integrated Risk Management Work Plan allotted time to define the Region Appeals risk appetite in concert with the development of the new strategic plan and term of council priorities. Strategies that will be developed to achieve the term of council priorities should reflect the level of risk the region is willing to pursue. Anella will now take us through risk appetite setting and benefits. Thank you, Michelle. Good morning, everyone. Before we start our discussion on risk appetite, let's discuss risk. We define risk as the effect of uncertainty on objectives and outcome. Region, like other organizations, is exposed to different types of risk while it pursues its strategic objectives and term of council priorities. How much risk is appropriate is determined by setting risk appetite, which is defined as the level of uncertainty the region is willing to accept in pursuit of its strategic objectives and term of council priority. The greater the level of certainty region desires, it is likely that it would need to invest more resources to implement controls to achieve the desired certainty. Whereas the level of uncertainty the region accepts may expose the region to more risk or it may bring opportunities for the region. Risk appetite, why needed? Clearly articulated risk appetite will help management and staff understand how much risk is acceptable in pursuing strategic objectives. What will be our appetite for financial risk versus social risk? How do we decide the potential trade-off between risks and opportunities? Risk is a forward-facing, an unknown event that may occur. It may expose the region to threats. It may provide opportunities. A perfect example from the region would be the outsourcing of laboratory services for water and wastewater program. A risk assessment indicated that there would be no increase in our risk exposure by outsourcing the lab services. The outsourcing resulted in lower cost while maintaining the quality and efficiency of the program. Risk appetite will help find answers to questions like, 
What is the organization's attitude towards risk? Do we have an organization-wide attitude? Or it is based on department, divisions, or individual's risk attitude? What do we do when we anticipate risk? Do we avoid it or take it? How region defines risk avoidance and risk taking and other attitudes in between? Are the risks accepted in line with council, the executive leadership team, and stakeholders' risk appetite? Does the organization bring recommendations to leadership team and council in line with council's risk appetite? Risk appetite setting attempts to answer these questions. What are the benefits of risk appetite? The risk appetite, the region's risk appetite will assist in integrating the concept of risk and strategic planning processes and day-to-day decision making. It will help guide the allocation of resources. For example, if we choose to take on more risk, we are comfortable with uncertainty and we are willing to implement lower level of controls, whereas if we are uncomfortable, we will allocate more resources to implement controls to minimize our risk exposures and uncertainty. <coughs> risk appetite will influence the organization's attitude towards risk. It will develop a culture where employees will know the parameters for risk taking. This diagram explains that the region risk appetite is developed at strategic objectives and it will help in determining risk tolerance at an operational level. As mentioned earlier, risk appetite is the level of uncertainty an organization is willing to accept in pursuit of its objectives. Risk tolerance is the limit of an organization for taking on risk. In the example of laboratory services, region had an appetite to take on risk and go out of its comfort zone and outsource the lab services. However, region has a low tolerance for compromising on quality and efficiency. In future, if outsourcing results in reduced qual lower quality or reduced efficiency, Region has to reevaluate its decision. Risk appetite has been defined in the context of strategic objectives and term of council priorities. Through the discussion with executive leadership team, it was noted that there are different appetites for different risk. For example, region may have a lower appetite for reputational risk while it may have a higher appetite for social risk, and it may be willing to take some risks to explore different options due to the volume and complexities of the issues we face. Risk appetite will not set hard limits. Risk appetite has been expressed in relative terms using the set of criteria. And Michelle will be taking us through those criteria shortly. We have developed risk principles which will provide guidance to staff as to when and for what purpose risk taking is acceptable for the region and when it is not. Risk principles clearly articulate region's expectation for risk taking. The region will manage risk to help ensure that risk we take advance our strategic objectives term of council priorities, and desired outcome. <laughs> risk we take are in line with stakeholders' expectations. Risk we take are in line with region's long-term financial planning strategy. The long-term financial planning strategy ensures long-term sustainability 
of the projects and services. Risks we take do not expose the region to undue financial harm that may impact region's ability to provide resources where needed. And finally, risk we take do not compromise or damage the region's reputation. Region is not willing to lose trust and confidence of its stakeholders. Michelle will now take us through the risk appetite scale, risk philosophy, and proposed risk appetite. A risk appetite scale is a set of criteria that underlines type, philosophy, tolerance for uncertainty, choice, and trade-off. It differentiates among a lower appetite to a higher. For example, an adverse risk, adverse take, from adverse to risk taker, and allows the user to select based on the criteria, the risk they face, and where they choose to be. Upon individual selection, a group can discuss the results and decide where as an organization they should be. Considering factors include an organization's vision, its mission, its values, its stakeholders, and the environment in which it operates, for example, private sector versus a public sector organization. Internal Audit conducted a facilitated se session with the members of the executive leadership team as a proxy for council in order to reach consensus on where the region should be based on the strategic risk the region face as it pursues its objectives. The five-point scale is used to determine risk appetite, and they include averse, which the philosophy is sacred and avoidance of risk is a core objective. Tolerance for uncertainty would be extremely low, and given a choice, we would always choose the lowest option, and we would not be willing to trade off. An example would be an investor that chooses to be in guaranteed investment certificates, where the preservation of their principal is a core objective, and that their uh, income is guaranteed. We also have minimalists. This is also on the lower end scale. The philosophy is to be extremely conservative, with a low tolerance for uncertainty, we would only accept if there was a limited possibility of failure. Given a choice, it would be with reluctance. So the middle of the road is cautious. The philosophy is a preference for safe delivery. There's a limited tolerance for uncertainty. We will accept if limited and heavily outweighed by the benefits. Given a choice, we would prefer to avoid. Under flexible, we would take strongly justified risk. This is an import, important point to note that even while risk taking, there's still an expectation that you would do a deep analysis of costs and benefits of taking the risk. For tolerance for uncertainty, you would be accepting some, and given a choice, you would be willing to put at risk, but you may manage its impact. And trading off, you would do it under the right conditions. Finally, there's the taker. They will take justified risks. They fully anticipate and are comfortable with uncertainty. Given a choice, they're always going to make the choice that will give them the highest return, and they accept the possibility of failure. Trade-off, they are willing. An example of an extreme risk taker would be a possible person who's a gambler. Um, <laughs> also a good example would be the person that plays aggressively in the stock market. They're either going to win big or they're going to lose big. So we have grouped the five-point scale into three broad categories, which we have now defined as our risk appetite philosophy. So our philosophy for managing indicates a low risk appetite, an extremely conservative approach, and a low tolerance for uncertainty. Our philosophy for maintaining indicates a moderate risk appetite with a preference for safe delivery and a limited tolerance for uncertainty. And our philosophy for taking appropriate risks indicate that the region has a higher appetite for risk with due consideration of the costs and benefits for taking the risk, potential impacts, and the expectation that the region will be accepting some uncertainty. So based on the criteria and with using our 
executive leadership team as a proxy, where did we land? So under the low appetite, which we call the managing area, we have reputational risk and compliance. Ensuring the trust and confidence of our community and stakeholder, and as a government organization, we need to ensure we lead by example and comply with the regulations and legislations we are governed by. We will manage to ensure compliance and protect our reputation. Under moderate, we have governance, economic and financial, capital asset and infrastructure. Under governance, a moderate risk appetite will empower employees while maintaining accountability and stewardship. Having a moderate formal structure of policies and procedures still allows for flexibility when changes are required and allows the region to remain agile. Under economic and financial, a moderate appetite that will allow us to maintain our economic health while meeting the current and future service needs. Also for capital asset and infrastructure, we wish to meet the service needs of the present while still sustaining our infrastructure for future demands. Under higher appetite, which we call take appropriate risk, we have social, environmental, and service delivery. For social risk, we landed on a higher appetite due to the complexities of the social issues that we face and uncertainty involved with social risk and the number of stakeholders that we felt that taking a higher appetite may allow us to address these complex issues, which would be similar to where we landed for environmental risk. Due to the complexities of the issues we face, we may involve different methods to manage it and involve different stakeholders. And finally, service delivery risk, we landed on a higher appetite, which will allow us to explore innovative opportunities to modernize our service delivery. That completes our presentation, and we'd be happy to take any questions that you, Council may have at this time. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that, I thought that was an excellent presentation. I'm glad that it was referred from audit here to the full council. I think that's very important. And we do have a someone on the board, Councillor Ras. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Michelle and Neela, for your uh, presentation. I, I think it's good as we move into the decision-making model, now that we've articulated what our risk thresholds are, yeah. are we going to be incorporating, um, uh, when new programs and things come to light, whether it's through budget or through um, regular programming, programming, what our appetite or, or our risk level is going to be for those individual programs? Yes, so absolutely. So one of the significant changes that it will be starting with the executive leadership team first is as reports go forward, there will be a risk analysis in there and the discussion on whether it's in line with our appetite. And then they, that will also be coming forward to the council report. So we're starting with the executive leadership first. Um, they've been generous to continue to be our, our uh, test. So we'll see um, how it flows and the information that flows to them, if it's meeting their needs. And then once we've uh, met that milestone, then we're going to start to be deliberate and make those changes to the council reports as well. Okay, that good. you guys will see those risk discussions in your council reports. For so long, we've concentrated on financial considerations, but to include, Other I mean, that's an element yeah. of the risk that we're dealing with. But it'll also get, uh, when we talked about culture at audit and risk, it'll also get the rest of the staff thinking about how they incorporate risk into their everyday practices, which is good. Um, and thank you very much for the presentation. And I hope for some people who maybe haven't been exposed to the um, uh, uh, to what risk and how businesses manage risk. I think this is a really good introduction to it. So thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Russ. So we're moving the presentation and then the proposed approach as well, correct? So we'll move by Councillor Russ, seconded by Councillor Tovey. All in favor? Any opposed? <coughs> Carried. Um, thank you. 10.6 is the uh, minutes, the report of the audit uh, and risk committee. Uh, moved by Councillor Starr, seconded by Councillor Ross. All in favor? Any opposed? Carried. 10.7 uh, is the report minutes of the Emergency Management Committee uh, for May 5th. Moved by Councillor McFadden, seconded by 
Councillor Innes, all in favor? Any opposed? Carried. And item 11.1 .1 is uh, correspondence from Trevor Wilcox, Secretary of Treasurer a AMO. Uh, Councillor Toby. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to, uh, I would like to nominate uh, Mayor Thompson. Okay, we need, uh, so moved by, do, do I need to read this out? Should I read this out or, or we'll say, moved by Councillor Toby, we need a seconder. Second. Moved by Councillor Downey, all in favor? Any opposed? Carried, congratulations. <laughs> Um, and back to you, <laughs> Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, that brings us to items related to public works. Councillor Starr, if you'd chair this section. The stopping prohibition in Ward 1. Councillor Shaughnessy. Moved by, seconded by Councillor Downey. All in favor? Carry <coughs> Engineering Services in Ward 9. Councillor Sado. Seconded by Councillor Rass. All in favor? Carried. Uh, we have uh, communications from the Minister of MNR regarding <coughs> Great Lakes. Councillor Tovey and Councillor Kovac. All in favor? Carried. Uh, we also have uh, correspondence from uh, Halton Region regarding Source Protection Committee. Uh, we need some direction on that one, a nomination. Do I hear any nominations? I'm sorry? Oh. That Holton remains the Yeah, okay, so that's, that's fine then. Okay, so that's our direction. Uh, moved by uh, Mayor Thompson, seconded by Mayor Jeffrey. All in favor? Carried. Back to you. Three minutes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, other business, there's a request from uh, Paul Gregory for, to do a delegation at the next um, council meeting. Someone would like to move that. Moved by Councillor Moore, seconded by Councillor Kovac. All in favour? Carried. Um, no notices of motion. Bylaws. Uh, moved by Councillor Fonseca, seconded by Councillor uh, Miles, that the bylaws listed on regional council agenda being bylaws 36-2016 and 37-2016 be given the required number of readings taken as read, signed by the regional chair and the regional clerk, and the corporate seal be affixed there too. All in favor? Opposed if any, carried. Uh, in camera, I don't, I don't, is there a need to go? I don't believe there's a need to go into camera, so. Okay. <laughs> uh, moved by Mayor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Shaughnessy, uh, that the May 12, 2016 Regional Council closed session report be received, and further that the recommendation contained within the confidential report relating to item 17.2 listed on the May 26, 2016 Regional Council agenda be approved and become public upon adoption. All in favor? Opposed, if any, carried. Uh, by law to confirm the proceedings of council. Uh, moved by Councillor Gibson, second by Councillor Sato, that the bylaw 38 2016 to confirm the proceedings of regional council at its meeting held on May 26, 2016, and to authorize the execution of documents in accordance with the region appeal bylaws relating thereto, be given the required number of readings taken as read, signed by the regional chair and the regional clerk and the corporate seal be affixed there too. All in favor? Opposed if any? Carried. Thank you. Uh, moved by Councillor Sprovieri, seconded by Councillor Mahoney, that the May 26, 2016 Regional Council meeting be adjourned. All in favor? Opposed if any? Carried. Thank you. Thank you.